My name is Michelle Peters Snyder. I work for the Nature Conservancy. I'm the Oyster Restoration Coordinator for the Indian River Lagoon. We have a project where we are putting um, about 40 acres worth of oyster reefs into the Mosquito Lagoon, which is the northern portion of the Indian River Lagoon system. We, we use oyster mats, which I travel all over making oyster mats with the public, schools, scouts, um, any kind of club. Uh, anybody who's interested, I give a presentation and we make these mats. Now, this is just a, a small demonstration, but I just wanted to show you how, how it works in the water. Um, we have a mat with 36 oyster shells on it. Well, right now it's 35. What I'm going to do is attach this final shell to it. It's a specific way. Goes beneath two parallel bars and the shell should be upright and locked. Oyster Reef, we're going to take several hundred of these mats and they're going to be placed into the waters of the lagoon. Um, generally, in, in nature, at the base of the mangrove roots, you're, you're generally going to see some forms of, of oysters, uh, clams, little bivalves um, right there in the water. So what we would be doing, and there are several different ways and methods to do it, um, they would just basically go at the base of at the base of the mangroves. Now you can see that um, it did it did suspend some of the sediments and make it a little bit muddy. That will settle out. Um, that's one reason why we we want the shells to be vertical and three dimensional because. Um, we want, rather than mud to be on top of these, we, the idea is to have new oyster larvae attached to these mats and grow from there. The reason we're doing this is because oysters are what we call a keystone species. They are very important to the entire population and the health of a lot of different plants and animals is dependent on the health of the oysters. If you look at the oyster shells, generally you're going to see that, wow, there's another oyster shell attached to my oyster shell. This is because oysters live as a community. Oysters, um, oysters are sessile. They don't move around. They have to be attached to a hard surface. Now, additionally, you're also going to see evidence of barnacles, um, sponges, tube worms. Um, lots and lots of animals use the oyster reefs as habitat, as a place to live. Additionally, little fish are going to be swimming in and out to escape predation um, and to be searching for food. So, Oysters are very important for habitat, as well as a food source of uh, birds, raccoons, otters, all kinds of fish, as well as people like oysters. So oysters are important for the habitat, for the food. Additionally, you'll see that they're muddy. This is because they're generally stuck in the mud. This actually helps to prevent erosion by anchoring the sediments and keeping them there. So that's the third very important thing about oysters. Now the final and probably one of the most important um, functions of an oyster, oysters are bivalves. That means that they generally have two shells. They have two shells and they are connected at a hinge. When the shells are underwater, they're going to open up just a little bit. And the oyster filters the water. That's how the oyster feeds and gets its nutrients. Now when the oyster is filtering water, they're removing all kinds of algae, plankton, suspended sediments, whatever's in the water, the oysters will filter out. One single oyster has the capabilities to filter between three and five gallons of water every hour. So if we're talking about an oyster reef, that's a considerable amount of water that the oysters are able to filter naturally um, on a 24-7, you know, continuing sort of basis. So those are the four things that make oysters a keystone species. Again, habitat, food, um, preventing erosion, and filtering and cleaning the waters. So they're already made. We made these at the Enchanted Forest earlier this week. And I have buckets of drilled shells and undrilled shells. If I can find any volunteers to drill those shells for me, that would be wonderful. And I'm just getting some zip ties so that we can make some more mats. Um, I have volunteers that put all of these into bundles of 36, which does make it a whole lot easier because we don't have to count um, all of the shells on all of them. Seven, 
and I took these pictures in January of 2008. So this is about seven months of being out in the water. Um, there are obviously there already are attracting seagrasses and other wildlife there. Now, if we look at a close-up of the map, you can see the sprinkler donut right here. It's covered with a seasonal algae. There's a new live oyster right here. Up top there, there's a few <coughs> coming in the water column. Now, because oysters make their own shells, the larvae is growing as well. By the time the larvae is about 10 days to two weeks old, the weight of its shell makes it sink down, and at that point it has to attach to a hard surface. Um, they'll attach to just about anything, but they are sort of um, chemically attracted to the material that's in other oyster shells. So we just put these out as a substrate or a cradle to catch the larvae. Basically, uh, as soon as you put them in the water and walk away, there's going to be a fish swim over there just to check it out. So it, it, it's like an instant, instant addition to the to the ecosystem that they know the, the the methods to make them out. This is a science that tie has been a lot. The tie needs to go beneath two parallel bars on your mat. What you want to do is mat, so you want your shells to stand up. Your shells can be close, they can be touching. And the way to do that is sort of start in the center of the mat, but then be random. Um, I have this. I have two bikes. Now that's fine. Now that's your bike. Now that's your now, okay, what do you do here? You go like this, red first. I do that.